so thanks everybody for coming. Uh, so Psyched Up is a book about practical techniques you can use in those moments before you're on the stage at work, whether it's a big sales call, a big presentation, a job interview, pitching investors. The theory behind the book is that most of our professional lives now are not totally routine where the same hour of every day is the same. Our lives are a little bit more like athletes where we go through a lot of practice, but then we have this these very important moments like a game um, where our performance is judged and that getting ready for these high stakes moments. If we can find something productive to do in that period where people tend to get nervous beforehand, we're probably going to perform better and we'll experience more benefits from our career from that. So to start, let's look at a couple of pictures and think about how athletes approach these moments. Slide, please. So this is a photo of the New England Patriots led by Tom Brady coming into Super Bowl 49 against Seattle a few years ago. Um, when most people look at this photo, they immediately notice the look on Brady's face. They say he's locked in, he's focused, he's ready, he's determined. Um, the next thing they tend to notice is that not just Brady, but the players behind him are all wearing headphones and they'll start to think about, gosh, what are they listening to? Do they have special music or special special playlists they're listening to to get themselves motivated for the games? And in fact, most players do. Um, if you're a professional athlete at this level, what you're doing before a game like this is very highly choreographed. There's probably psychologists involved in helping you put together the routine. And we can learn from the approach these people are making. Slide, slide please. This is a photo of Michael Phelps, the swimmer before the Olympics in Sydney a few years ago. Um, very different facial expression before he goes into the swimming pool. Um, he's staring down, looking very angrily at his chief rival and, uh, He's using his emotions in a very different way. Why would it be useful for a swimmer to be angry before he gets into the pool? Um, this photo attracted a lot of attention and went viral on Twitter. The hashtag was Phelps face. Um, so very different way of using emotions before a very different kind of competition. So next slide, please. This last picture is a picture of Serena Williams before the U.S. Open going into the locker room area. Um, her face is not as easy to read as Phelps and Brady's were, um, but most people who look at it and think about what emotions she's experiencing say that she looks a little bit anxious. Um, and sometimes they talk about whether anxiety can be useful or not useful before an event like this. Um, so three different athletes, three different apparent emotions before they go into a competition. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the way we can learn and what we can use from what they do. Next slide, please. So that's basically the challenge here is how can you find practical techniques to fine tune your emotions before you go into these sort of competitive events, these high stakes moments in your own professional life. Um, next slide, please. So when you write a book, the first question that everybody asks you is, where did the idea for the book come from? So this the idea for this book came from three different areas. Um, the first is from my own meager athletic career. I'm circled up in the back row. I was not much of a football player in high school, but I was on the team and I absorbed a lot of the pep talks and the rituals and the rivalries and the things that the coaches and the captains and the players would do to get ready for those Friday night lights events. Um, I absorbed that sort of culture and became fascinated by what these techniques were. And I was curious whether there was any science to back them up. Next slide, please. And long after I got out of school, I would occasionally run into former athletes who were into professional careers who were still using some of these techniques. Um, this fellow is a, a neurosurgeon, a brain surgeon based in New Jersey. His name is Dr. Mark McLaughlin. He's a former state champion and collegiate wrestler. And he went to medical school, became a surgeon, but he said the way he really approaches a surgery is much like he did a, a wrestling match. He uses the same sort of sports psychology techniques. He listens to certain music before he operates. He has certain rituals and symbols. He keeps a tray nearby of surgical instruments that used to belong to his mentor, the surgeon that trained him. Even though he never touches those instruments during the surgery, he likes having them nearby as a lucky, as a good luck charm. Um, I watched him do surgery down at a hospital in New Jersey. You know, instead of giving doses of 20 milligrams of medication, 
he'd give 19 milligrams because nine is his lucky number. Um, and little things like that throughout the surgery help him feel more confident. He's using the same sort of techniques in sports, in sports psychology to try to be a better surgeon. Next slide, please. The third thing that happened that made me want to write this book is when I began working at Harvard Business Review, I started spending a lot of my day looking at academic research. And I began seeing a series of papers that utilize some of the same techniques that sports psychology talks about to see if white collar people could do better in their jobs. There's actually academic research on the power of trash talking um, or how rituals can help you. Many of you may be familiar with the work of Amy Cuddy, who did some work on power posing, which is the idea that if you stand a certain way for a few seconds before you engage in an activity, that your body chemistry actually changes and helps you be more confident. Um, so there is actual academic research that looks at all of this. Next slide, please. So if you want to try to use these techniques in your own life, the first thing I advise you to do is to think about what your use case is. This is basically, think about the month of work you have ahead of you, or since we're going into the holidays, think about maybe the first quarter of next year. And think if you were to isolate on the days that matter most and the moments that matter most. You know, if you could, slide please, if you could actually like circle a day on a calendar and have a guarantee that on this day, you're going to have your A game, you're going to you know, perform to the best of your abilities. So focus on what those moments are where you add the most value that have the biggest impact on your performance. For me as an editor and a writer, some of those moments are very quiet moments where I'm editing a very important article. Some of those moments are out where I'm talking about my work, giving a presentation on my work. Sometimes it's when I'm pitching an idea to an editor or to a writer. Um, so even though my job is very head down, I have these moments where I really need to be on top of my game, where I might be a little bit nervous and I really need to sort of control those emotions. So think about over the next few months in your own work life, what are the moments when you would most like to be psyched up and in that ideal mental state for performance. Slide, please. So when I started reporting this book, I had a very naive and not very sophisticated view of what it meant to be psyched up. I you know, went back to high school football days where getting psyched was all about adrenaline and it was all about sort of raising your body metabolism and getting energized and getting excited. And I saw it very much as a binary light switch kind of thing. You were either, you know, your body was either up or it was down and getting psyched was really a matter of just sort of flipping that switch on. When you actually start to talk to psychologists and do the research, you find out that that's in fact not really how it works at all. Slide, please. The better metaphor is really to think about it as a series of volume knobs or a mixing board or something you're tuning. Um, adrenaline and biochemistry are important, but it's really your emotions that you need to deal with. It's not just about adrenaline. The three emotions that are most important in getting psyched up and getting into that right mental state, number one is confidence. Slide, please. Number two is anxiety. Um, we've all seen moments where somebody gets anxious when they're trying to perform. We've seen how anxiety can really subtract from the practice and the poise and the preparation you've put into something. We've seen somebody whose breath starts to quake a little bit, or they start talking too fast. Uh, when I've been on television, my children like to make fun of me because I blink a lot when I'm on television because that's what happens to me when I get nervous. Um, that's because I'm anxious. Uh, so finding a way to kind of minimize that anxiety in the moment can you know, help you get the most out of the practice you put in by reducing these markers that tell people it's not going so great. Slide, please. Then the third thing you really want to manage in terms of your emotions is your energy level. Um, think about the different kinds of performances you have to do at work. Um, there's a two minute TV interview for some people in their jobs versus an all day series of job interviews. Those are very different kinds of demands in terms of your energy. Um, think about whether you're giving a talk to 12 people in a conference room, 200 people at a, at a podium or 2000 people at an annual conference. Um, those require very different kinds of energy levels. Energy can be managed in a variety of ways, you know, making sure you're getting enough sleep, how much caffeine you've had, um, using music to sort of amp yourself up. There's other tools. But basically, before any kind of event, you want to you think about what's the right mix of confidence, 
anxiety and energy and try to, you know, get those tuned to the right place. Slide, please. So this photo is from one of the most fun days of reporting I spent on the book. Um, this is, this is, these are scenes from West Point, the U.S. Military Academy in New York. Um, they show the psychological training that they put their cadets through in order to do exactly this. Um, the people sitting in those weird egg-shaped chairs are engaged in a confidence-building exercise. Those chairs have speakers in them, and for each of the cadets, the psychologists have put together a custom audio track, not of music, but of people telling them how great they are, basically. I watched the goalie on the West Point lacrosse team sit in one of these chairs, and a soundtrack came on, and his booming voice said, Joe, you are the best goalie that West Point has ever had. Remember the game against Yale when you did this. Remember the game against Navy when you did that. It was basically an audio highlight reel of his best moments on the lacrosse field. And he would actually go in and sit in that chair and listen to this thing. He would take it, he had it on his iPhone. He would listen to it on headphones before practice, before games. It was a confidence building technique that they used that they find highly effective. Slide, please. So none of us are going to go out and buy egg-shaped chairs, and we're not going to have psychologists put together our own audio tracks to help us feel good about ourselves. But at the same time, each of us individually can think about our own greatest hits and think about how we can call them into our mind to help us feel confident in those moments before we perform. Imagine it this way. If you were an athlete and if ESPN was putting together a highlight reel of you, what would be on it? Now, try to translate that into your day-to-day -day job. You know, for me as a writer and an editor, I've worked on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles at this point, but there's probably about 10 or 15 that I think about as my greatest hits. And sometimes before I go into edit or to write a new article, I'll sit down and read one of those old articles just to remind myself that when I really bring my best self to work, that I can do this job really well. Um, I've seen salespeople who keep the sales awards they've uh, won on their wall, sort of in their line of sight when they're on the phone. Um, anything you can do to try to remind yourself of your best moments and keep them in the forefront of your mind right before you perform, that's only going to serve to increase your confidence, and that can be a very powerful technique. And it's probably the technique in the book that I personally have utilized the most. Slide, please. So this is Jerry Seinfeld uh, uh, preparing to do one of his shows. This is sort of the afternoon before one of his comedy shows. He's one of the people I interviewed for the book, and we talked a little bit about his backstage rituals. Um, I asked him what he does in the moments, you know, the 10 minutes before a show starts. And what he said was this. He said, every comedian, like every athlete, has a little routine. And my, re my routine is to look at my notes until five minutes before the show, then at exactly five minutes, the tour producer comes back. I put on my jacket. And when that jacket goes on, it's like my body knows, okay, now we've got to do our trick. Then I walk back and forth, back and forth. I never vary my routine. It signals to me that everything is ready to go. And it just feels very comfortable. If you talk to people who do these kind of performances for a living, they all have some sort of a ritual they do before a show. Stephen Colbert has an enormously complicated one. Um, it's sort of like the launch sequence before a rocket goes up. It's their way of getting their body in tune, of reminding themselves, hey, this is what I'm about to do. It, it's sort of a way to utilize those moments when you can be very anxious and to try to turn it into something productive and comforting. Slide, please. This is LeBron James before a game. This is one of his rituals. He throws chalk dust up into the air and is very theatrical about it. He has all sorts of rituals before a game. He does certain handshakes with each player. He mimes the, sig the symbol 330 with his hands because that's the area code from where he grew up in Ohio. He likes to give the basketball a little massage before the tip-off. Um, there's all sorts of theories about why this stuff works, but the research brings it down to two predominant theories. Um, number one is that, that these things serve as cues, and they basically signal to your body to go into that mode that they've been practicing for so long. The other one is that there's a distractive element to routines. So basically, routines are there during moments when we're otherwise going to be very anxious, and that doing the routine 
gives our mind something to occupy itself and helps us from having negative theories. So whatever you're doing, think about whether there's some routine that can help you get ready and take up the time in those nervous making moments. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the favorite studies I came across when I was reporting the book involved a golf club and a putting exercise. This was like a very academic study. Um, they did, they took college golfers who were all of equal ability and they had them all putting the same ball on the same green at the same distance. The only thing they varied, they had an A group and a B group. They all used the same putter, but before they handed the golfer the putter, half of them were told, oh, funny story, we actually bought this club from a professional golfer. It's been used on the tour. The people who thought that they were using the professional golf club putted about a third better just because of the club. It was the same club, they were lying, but knowing that you're using something that has a provenance or a history or some sort of luck to it can have a very powerful effect. Think of back to that brain surgeon and the instruments he keeps by his tray, even though he's not going to use them. They make him feel better. Michael Jordan wore his college basketball shorts under his NBA shorts in every NBA game because they reminded him of how good he was in college. So think a little bit about whether you can have some lucky object, some physical manifestation that helps you feel good and gives you confidence before you go to perform. Slide, please. Some of you may recognize this is Malcolm Gladwell. Um, Gladwell is probably one of the most successful nonfiction writers uh, of the last 20 years, at least. And um, when I was writing the book, I wanted to test the power of a lucky object. So I actually tried to manufacture one. Um, so Gladwell and I knew each other vaguely back in the 90s when we were both young reporters. I'd come across this golf study. And so I reached out to Malcolm and I said, hey, I'd like to have a lucky keyboard to write my book on. So I'd like to mail you a brand new computer keyboard. I'd like you to type on it for three months and then send it back to me. And I'm only going to use it during like my high stakes moments at work. So slide, please. So this is my lucky keyboard. I keep it in my office. I don't use it every day because I don't want the magic to wear off. But during those moments when I have to write something that really is really important or when I feel like I'm struggling a little bit, I can go to the, go down to the cabinet and pull out Malcolm Gladwell's old keyboard. He broke the down arrow key off of it. You can see, uh, helps me feel a little bit more confident. I know that my fingers are in the same place that one of the best writers of, of English uh, have been. And it's one small technique to help me feel a little bit more confident during those moments. So something you can think about trying to find in your own professional life is, is something that can give you that boost of confidence. Slide, please. So one of the other chapters in the book looks at the use of music um, as a psych up tool. Um, this is super common. Anybody who's ever run a marathon with headphones on probably made some sort of a motivational playlist. Um, uh, locker rooms, uh, everybody's wearing headphones these days. Music is really widely recognized as a great way to sort of fine tune your emotions before a performance. Um, there's more than 100 studies have been done on this um, that music can change your mood. It can reduce the pain you feel during times. Um, the main thing to, that comes out of these studies that can be useful to you is that there are two main elements of music that make it motivational. Number one is what they call the intrinsic musicality, and the other one is the emotional contextual association. The way to know the difference between them if you hear a song for the first time and it suddenly makes you perk up and makes you walk a little bit quicker, you're responding to the intrinsic musicality, the beat, the rhythm, the, just the way the music is. Um, that, the right kinds of music, that can have a powerful effect. The emotional contextual association, that means music is bringing you back to a moment in your life. Maybe it was a song from your prom or your wedding, or maybe it was the song that your basketball team warmed up to in high school. Songs can have very, very powerful associations for us. Um, the trick is between the intrinsic musicality and the contextual cues to try to find some songs that just lift you up a little bit. And, you know, most of us in our lives, if we're, if we're going to an, an important business event, we're probably either driving in our car by ourselves where we have access to music or we're, you know, walking or doing public transportation where we can put some headphones on. So there's a lot of ways to incorporate music into these preparatory routines. The trick is to find a series of uh, musical cues that are going to help you get into that right state to perform. Slide, please. So the next thing to talk about is anxiety. So we've talked about ways to sort of boost your confidence before these events. 
Um, those are mostly about cranking up your confidence. With anxiety in general, in the moment, you want to crank your anxiety down. It can be super, super useful to be anxious about something at work two or three weeks ahead of time because that anxiety can help you practice and prepare and you know put in a little bit more time for it. Um, but if, if you're about to go into an important, if you're about to give a TED talk, um, five minutes before you go on stage, that's not a time to be anxious. And it's better if you can try to take steps to minimize that anxiety. So let's talk about a couple of specific steps you can do. Slide, please. So one of the te techniques is called reappraisal, which is basically taking a set of circumstances and reframing the way you look at it. Um, and there's a specific researcher who's done a lot of interesting work on this. Slide, please. Um, this is Allison Wood Brooks, who's a young professor at Harvard Business School. She did her undergraduate work at Princeton, where she was actually in um, an acapella singing group. It was a lot like the movie Pitch Perfect, if any of you have seen Pitch Perfect. And so Allison got into the, the group as a freshman and as a sophomore, junior, and senior, she was in charge of auditions. So she saw hundreds and hundreds of people audition for this comp very competitive uh, group. And she noticed that people were nervous beforehand or they were very confident and optimistic beforehand. And she noticed that the people who looked nervous before they auditioned generally didn't do too well. And she began to be very interested in how to manipulate this optimism and confidence versus this anxiety. She actually went on to do her doctoral dissertation on this. She had hundreds of people come in and perform the song, Don't Stop Believing" by Journey on a karaoke machine in front of a panel of judges. And as in all these studies, there was an A group and a B group, and she manipulated them a little bit. The A group, before they went onto the stage, they just looked at Allison and said, I'm so nervous. The other group, looked at her and said, I'm so excited. That was the only difference. Everybody's got about the same singing ability. They're singing the same song, same judges, same room. Just, I'm so excited. I'm so nervous. It turned out the I'm so excited group sang markedly better, according to the judges. They felt better about the way they performed. Everything about them was better just by reframing the set of emotions as excitement, which is a positive set as opposed to nervous. She did the same thing with public speaking tests, she did the same thing with math exams. Um, so reappraisal is a very powerful way to um, try to just reframe this mix of, of emotions that you're feeling as a little bit less negative, not nervous, but think about it a little bit more as excitement and as the opportunity and more about the upside bias. Slide, please. This is a uh, photo taken at Juilliard, the music school in New York City, which is another place I visited while reporting the book. Um, the people that play at Juilliard, the students that get in there are world-class musicians. Um, but when they graduate, they're going to be auditioning for jobs at orchestras and competing against other world-class musicians. Um, and they all technically have a lot of proficiency, but what they found is that they need to really find ways to manage their nervousness for auditions. So they teach an entire semester long course on how to deal with audition nerves at uh, Juilliard. They teach them all sorts of techniques. And some of the stuff they do sounds downright crazy. One of the classes, they have the students put their instruments on a chair, and then they have them do exercises like burpees and push-ups and planks, and then jump up from the plank and start playing their instrument. And the point is, they want them to get used to playing when they're a little bit sweaty. They want them to get used to playing when they're a little bit out of breath. Um, it's sort of like an adversity training technique. Sometimes they'll put cameras on them and just get them really used to, to playing under a microscope. So there's some of this you can use yourself too. try to get in the habit that if you feel a little bit sweaty or you feel a little bit out of breath, it's not the end of the world. Just learn to work through it a little bit. And the more you practice at it, the better you can get. Slide, please. One of the other techniques they teach at Juilliard is what they call centering, which is a psychological technique. It incorporates deep breathing and the use of focal points and tensing up your body and releasing it in very specific ways. It's a little bit, it's like yoga. It's a little bit hard to describe. Uh, you sort of have to try it. Um, one of the best ways to do it is to look at a series of videos that's on YouTube. Just look up the word centering center. This is called the centering training series. Um, this can be a really powerful way to 
deal with your anxiety. Um, the other thing you can think about if this is really a big issue for you, there are coaches and performance psychologists who specialize in this kind of work, and some of them are very, very specialized. So my daughter is a competitive equestrian. She's a, in college now. She rides a nationally on the college circuit, and she tends to get nervous and not breathe well when she's riding. So we found a psychologist who specializes in equestrians. She saw her three times. They worked on some breathing techniques, and it made a world of difference for her. So this the coaching and the psychology work that's done in this field, this is not like you're going to lie on a couch and talk about your childhood for six months. This is very sort of quick hit, short, focused, exercise driven. So if anxiety is something that's holding you back from performing your best, um, and you try this stuff on your own and you feel like it's not helping, definitely try to seek out the right kind of coaching to um, to help you find a way to better manage the, that set of emotions. Next slide, please. One of the other things I talk about in the book is when you move from an individual setting to a group setting, when it's not just you you're trying to psych up, but you're a coach or a captain or a leader, and you're in charge of trying to motivate an entire group before they go into a performance event. Um, in business, the most typical scenario here is uh, in a sales setting, uh, I've gone into companies and watched the sales leader talk to the sales force on the last week of the month when everybody's trying to close those big deals. Um, the atmosphere is a lot like it is in a college locker room before a big sporting event. And there's research done on what works and what doesn't in this field. And it shows there are a lot of parallels there. Um, next slide, please. So the military, uh, sales, athletics, those are all places where one of the expected duties of the leader is to give that pep talk, to try to find the right words to motivate people. The discipline involved is called motivational language theory, and there's a whole academic uh, field behind it. But it basically comes down to three things. Next slide. The first thing you want to do in a, in a pep talk is what they call direction giving, which is the actual like nuts and bolts of how you're going to win. So if you were on uh, the founding team of a startup that was pitching VCs, say there were three of you, and you were going to go into the room and give a joint presentation together, the direction giving is the actual stuff of the presentation. Who's going to say what, when, what kind of emotions you're trying to convey. You know, in football, this would be the X's and O's and the blocking and tackling, the, the very specific thing that you're trying to ask the group to do. Next slide, please. For a leader, the next important part of a pep talk uh, to motivate people in these key moments is empathy. Empathy tries to create a personal connection between the leader and the followers. Um, it just shows that there's caring involved. It can be simply as something like saying, look, I know what I'm trying or I know what I'm asking you to do today is really hard. You know, I know it feels like there's a lot of obstacles. I know we all feel tired. We've been working really hard, um, but this matters. I appreciate how hard you're working. Let's go out there and do it. Leadership is about showing that you care and empathy is the way to do that. So in addition to direction giving, showing some empathy is the second element in a successful pep talk. Slide, please. So after direction giving, after empathy, the third element of a successful pep talk is meaning making. Um, this is basically telling people why this matters. It's connecting the task at hand with a larger mission, something important, um, telling them why making the sales call helps bring the company closer to its IPO or closer to meeting its revenue estimate for the quarter. Um, try to take what might seem like a small quotidian task and connect it to something larger that people believe in. Um, one of the people I talked to while reporting the book was Stanley McChrystal, the army general who was running the special forces for most of the last set of wars. He used a variation on this formula. He said the way he would give a pep talk before the special forces would go out, he'd start out with, here's what I'm asking you to do. That's the direction giving. Here's why it's important. That's meaning making. Here's why I know you can do it. That's both confidence building and empathy. Think about what we've done together before. That's creating a connection. That's the empathy. Now let's go out and do it. So there really is a science to what works with these pep talks. And as you go from being more of an individual contributor to being more of a, a leader, it's not just about getting yourself psyched up to perform. 
it's also about getting your people psyched up to perform. Um, if you don't have a chance to read the book and you're interested in this specific element, this science of pep talks, I wrote a whole article for HBR about just that topic. So if you go to Google and you uh, Google on Harvard Business Review, the science of pep talks, it'll pop right up for free. So it's a great primer and overview of this one topic in the book. Next slide, please. So that's kind of a quick overview of what's in the book and some of the techniques that I think are uh, most practical and easiest for most people to use. I think in order to make the most of these techniques, you really need to assess yourself and figure out which of these is most useful for you. Some people get really anxious before these moments, and for them, the techniques like reappraisal that help or centering that help them deal with the anxiety those are going to be the most effective. Other people tend not to get very anxious, but they lack confidence. Um, so for them, some of the confidence building techniques. Um, for me personally, that greatest hits technique has been really, really useful. Um, before I sit down to edit, I'll go back and look at something I've edited that I really love in the past. Before I give a public, uh, before I speak at, at an event, sometimes I'll listen to myself on a podcast that's been very smoothly edited to make me sound even more articulate than I am in real life. Um, it'll just help me concentrate on the fact that, wow, you know, that sounds pretty good. I really can put words together in a decent way. Uh, I try to, before I go into these kind of events, I try to do things that are going to make me feel good about myself, remind me of times when I've excelled. Um, and I think that helps put you in the right mindset for these high stakes moments at work. So I'm going to turn it back to Zach and see if we have any questions. I think we have 10 or 15 minutes left. And again, I appreciate those of you who've sat through the technical problems we had at the beginning. I apologize for that. And I hope we can make the most of our time together. Uh, Daniel, thanks so much. Um, we, we definitely, I think, lost a couple people with the um, uh, some of the, the issues getting started before, um, but the recording will be available. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, one maybe to start with. Um, uh, one question just asking um, about about medication or anything um, anything like that that people take before, um, or like home remedies, anything along those lines before a, a big presentation or pitch or anything like that? Did your research in the book or anything like that cover um, cover any of those aspects? Yeah, there is a chapter in the book on that. Um, it's funny, when I, when I outlined the book at the beginning before I started reporting, I'd never even really heard of these drugs and didn't plan on writing about them. But as I started reporting on how people deal with anxiety before public speaking in particular, I kept running into people all over the place who were saying, oh, well, have you ever heard about beta blockers? Have you tried beta blockers? Um, I'd never even heard of them, in fact. But beta blockers are medication that were discovered in the 1960s. Uh, a guy won the Nobel Prize for discovering them. Um, they were originally used as a blood pre pressure medication. And what beta blockers do is they reduce your body's response to adrenaline. Um, so they, were, they started, started for cardiac patients in the 60s. By the 70s, classical musicians were realizing that they were able to take these medications and reduce some of the anxiety and some of the nervousness that accompanies auditions. Um, so musicians were the first ones to use it. It kind of spread from there. Um, they, I've talked to people who've used them, and if, you, if you're somebody that sweats a lot when you get up on stage or you're somebody that has problems breathing or you blink a lot, generally beta blockers will reduce that sensation. It just sort of takes that flush and that, that fast heartbeat and minimizes it to a certain extent. Um, as part of the reporting for the book, I went to a doctor and explained that I was doing a book on this and that I wanted to try beta blockers. So I got a prescription for them myself. Um, I've tried them a few times. To be honest, I'm not somebody that gets super nervous about this kind of stuff. So I didn't notice that big an effect myself. Um, but for people who really do have uh, sort of mild anxiety attacks before these events, um, they can make a difference. So I certainly wouldn't consider medication to be the first line of defense for this kind of thing. I would definitely try centering, try reappraisal, try maybe seeing a performance coach, um, try some of the more organic uh, biofeedback kind of techniques to deal with anxiety 
uh, in these stressful moments. But if all else fails and you feel like your job performance is really being impacted like this, then it's definitely worth a conversation with a physician to see about whether um, trying a medication might be something that will help you get over that hump. So there are, there are these kind of medications available. Great, Daniel. Thanks so much. Um, another another question here. Um, this is from someone who describes themselves as a, a leader of a sales team. Um, says that they are, uh, their company is losing market share to kind of an upstart competitor, and this is, I guess, a new experience for them in, in the marketplace. Um, he wants to light a fire uh, with with the sales team, uh, kind of seeing the the threat of the competition and how they're losing market share, and is just wondering how maybe how to do that, how to make them a little more angry, invested in in the the rivalry, take advantage of that a little bit better, um, rather than just the, the basic you know go meet your quota type of of messaging. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there are companies and there are business leaders who think that. Uh, it's best to just swim in your own lane and focus on your own organization. I used to, I spent some years in Detroit covering the car makers and you could not really get a general motors executive to talk about Ford. Like they would pretend general motors would pretend that they were the only car company on earth and they didn't like to really talk about the rivalry. Um, and then there are other business leaders that feel like in the same way that you're in a sporting context, you know, this is a zero sum game and we are fighting. If you're Coke, you're absolutely fighting against Pepsi every day. And it's, it's used that as a motivational force. Um, so there are business leaders who do that very effectively. Um, in the book, I spent some time with um, a guy named John Leisure, who is the CEO of T-Mobile. He's a person, he was a competitive athlete. He was a runner, uh, still runs marathons, I think. He, When he took over T-Mobile, he very much believed that the way to energize the uh, sales force and the customer service people at T-Mobile was to talk a lot about Verizon and Sprint and how terrible they were. He goes on Twitter all day long and just bashes his rivals and his competitors. Um, so I would try to um, fire people up, get them to focus on the rival. Um, there's research from um, the world of sports that suggests that uh, teams that play each other in a rivalry scenario, they work harder, they tend to feel pain less, um, they tend to score more points. Um, uh, teams that play in rivalries, you know, even collegiate rivalries, they see differences in the point differential, they see differences in attendance. Um, so in that kind of a situation, I would uh, play up the rivalry and the hostility and the idea that these people are trying to steal something from you. And if they're successful at it, uh, you know, our company is not going to uh, enjoy its life the way it has. Um, so I think getting people a little bit fired up the way you would in an athletic con context, especially if you're in a market share situation that's starting to go the wrong direction, um, it's definitely something I would use. Um, there is a chapter in the book on it, uh, and rivalry in business, when used appropriately, can be super effective. So I would encourage you to do that. Great. Um Daniel, another, and maybe this will be, be the last question. Um, there are two sort of kind of similar related questions, so I'll kind of combine them. Um, this one looking at, both looking at, um, at folks' kids, um, one talking about, a, it seems, a much younger kid who, um, I guess, practices very well and when in their sport, um, but then performs very poorly relatively in, in an actual game situation. Um, and so that's then they're feeling discouraged and they're, you know, not wanting to continue um, but that the, there's a lot of kind of potential there. Um, and then another, it seems like a high schooler preparing for, um, I'm assuming for the SAT or like a college admittance exam, um, uh, just feeling, doing pretty well on practice tests and then actually like just, just falling apart or almost falling apart before the, on the, during the actual test and trying to manage that anxiety. Um, so maybe, I guess it's really two questions, kind of anxiety, for, for younger kids who are performing much worse than actual competition or, or game, and then particularly, I guess, for, for high schoolers with kind of some of these big big moments that, that you know, affect where they get into college, if they're going to get scholarships, those sorts of things, especially if they're performing far worse than they, they are, would be, it would, you would expect them to be based on how, they, how well they practice. Yeah. Um, oh, a couple of things I can say about that. Um, on the athletic front, um, it depends how young the child is and how serious the state of competition is and where the career track is going. But um, 
there are a lot of sports psychologists around the country and they tend to be a very underutilized uh, asset. And, you know, I have children who've played AAU sports and I know plenty of people who are raising ice skaters and tennis players who, you know, spend literally thousands of dollars on the coaching of this. And I do think that enough of sports is mental that if you're going to spend a lot of money on the training and the coaching aspect of it, um, if anxiety and performance anxiety are starting to be issues that it can be useful to send a kid to a sports psychology again, just for a few visits to try to get a bead on it, to try to get a handle on what they're feeling and how they can kind of optimize those feelings. Um, it's hard for me to give specific recommendations without knowing exactly what's going on with the kid or what the sport is or whatever. But, um, I would say, uh, depending on the age and depending on the level, maybe think about a sports psychologist sooner rather than later. I do think they're an underutilized resource and that if, you know, if you're getting into a sport where a lot of people are, are devoting a lot of time and resources to training, that the psychology piece of it deserves some attention too. On the testing situation, um, I think the key is to try to give more confidence in those situations. Um, so for instance, this an analog, I, I wrote a piece one time about taking my teenager to her driving test, which is another one of those teenage rites of passage. And on the way to the driver's test, I said, you know, if you fail this, it's not that big a deal because you just have to wait two weeks and then we come back and take it again. And what I was trying to do when I said that was try to lower the stakes and minimize the anxiety by sort of minimizing the consequences saying, oh, you know, it's no big deal. You can take it again. And even when my kids took the SATs, you know, you can take the SATs lots of times. So it's tempting to try to lower the stakes and lower the pressure on them. In fact, that's usually the bad thing to do, the psychologists say, because you're kind of having the people focus on failure at a time when you want them really to be confident and to thinking about success. So instead, what the psychology says you're supposed to do in those instances is to use that greatest hit strategy and build them up a little bit. Talk about, you know, how proud you are of the time they put into studying for the test. Um, emphasize how well prepared they are. Um, think about moments from practice. You know, remember when you took that practice test with your tutor and you, you know, you scored amazingly well on that. I have a feeling the day is going to be like that. So don't focus so much on what can go wrong and minimizing it. Instead, focus on things that are going to build confidence, um, and really highlight their strengths and the fact that they put the time in, they've worked hard, and they've really set themselves up for success here. That's probably the best strategy for that kind of scenario. Great. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, a lot of really interesting um, interesting things that I think can have a big impact on some of these, these larger professional and, and personal moments that, that people have. Um, the recording for the event will be available online. I'll be able to cut out the um, uh, the portions where the sound wasn't working quite right, so we'll, um, people won't have to, have to sit through that in the recording. Um, and anyone who registered will receive an email with that link. Um, and then, of course, people can also register for upcoming uh, webinars and other programs on the upcoming events page. Um, so thanks for everyone who, who stuck with us and, and made, it, made it through. And, and thanks again, Dan, and everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.